Welcome to Questions with Pastor Dave. Questions with Pastor Dave is a weekly YouTube broadcast from Westminster United Methodist Church in Herod, Ohio, where Pastor Dave Burkhart will answer viewers' submitted questions. And now for your questions. Well, welcome back to another episode of uh, Questions with Pastor Dave. We're glad to have you here with us. And um, so, as many of you know, I'm Pastor Dave Burkhardt, and I pastor the Westminster United Methodist Church. I've done so now for uh, almost 14 years, and I just love this place. It's uh, exciting to be here. Uh, conservative, evangelical, uh, United Methodist Church, and uh, we're just, uh, we're happy to be in the life-saving business. And I have with me here uh, Rick Lamb. Rick is a member of my cluster group. Uh, we meet as a clergy cluster once a month, and uh, that way we're able to share some ideas with each other and bounce ideas off of each other and have a lot of fun. But Rick, uh, you're pastor in where now? Hume, right? I'm down at Hume United Methodist Church, just north of Cridersville a little bit, and uh, uh, just up from the Auglaes County line, as a matter of fact. So uh, it's been, uh, I started there uh, February 21st, uh, 2010. So I've just, I'm closing in on 10 years right wow. now. Yeah, so. That, that's kind of odd for United Methodist pastors to be at churches that long. I've well, been here 13 or 14. and Well, and but I, I started out pulpit supply, yeah. and then I went CLM, and then I was licensed for a while, and now I'm CLM again. So, you know, I've been through the, the uh, uh, different uh, chapters. But as long as I stay a CLM, they're not going to move me. So Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Get so to stay where you're at. Get to stay where I'm at. I enjoy the people. They're a lot of fun, and uh, uh, we, uh, we really have grown together. I guess that's one of the advantages of being a licensed local pastor in the Methodist Church, too, is yeah. we're not itinerant, they call that's it. That's right, yeah. So, yeah. so anyhow, we're here to answer your questions. So uh, enough about us. And we'll turn it over to Harry, and he can ask our question for today. Well, good evening, gentlemen. And the question for tonight is, is there absolute truth? My brother tells me there is not, but it seems to me that the idea of changing truth really is a cause of so many today's problems. Well, boy, now there's a question, <laughs> and, and a very good question, uh, one that I think uh, we need to address, uh, especially at the church level. And so when it comes to absolute truth, um, we're not seeing it so much in the world anymore, but we do in the church. Can you... Well, and in years past, uh, the church was an influence on the rest of society. Um, uh, places weren't open on Sunday because it was church day. And, and people respected one another because there was the influence of the church in the community. And, but we've kind of gotten away from that, haven't we? And uh, the church is playing a less of a role in our society today, and that's, that's part of the reason why uh, relativity has become so popular. And, and part of it's the church's fault. We didn't keep up with the times as far as that goes. Part of it is that uh, uh, the education system really wanted to weed out uh, the church from the involvement in people's lives. And so, um, and because we stopped getting involved in that sort of thing, we allowed it to happen, so. Yeah, and I think it's gonna get worse and worse as time uh, progresses. But I have to be honest with you, uh, before I became a Christian, I don't question whether there was absolute truth in the world. Really? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about you, but I know for me it was that way. Um, but then, uh, after I became a Christian and began to read the Bible, I began to see things like John 14, 6, where Jesus told the disciples just before he was arrested at the Garden of Gethsemane, um, he told them um, not to fear yeah. because he is the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him. And I began to realize there is absolute truth yep. in this world. Yep. There is absolute uh, truth. Jesus, uh, uh, you know, and I think He said something similar to Martha, too, that uh, 
that I am the resurrection, and that's a kind of a truthful statement, you know, because uh, he 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 showed it because he rose from the dead, and so uh, and and God, we we said this one last time was that uh, John seventeen seventeen, uh, where God says, or yeah, where Jesus praying to the Father says. Sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. So we see that God's word uh, is truth and we can rely on it uh, as a, uh, a standard for what is right and what is wrong, what is truthful and what is not truthful. Yeah. Um, Frank Turek is one of my uh, favorite apologists. Uh -huh. um, he's, he's an excellent debater and I'd love to meet him sometime. Uh, but he says when, when someone says that there is no absolute truth, the question you should automatically ask them in return is, is that true? <laughs> and so maybe or maybe not they'll answer, you know? I know. Uh, because if, if there is no such thing as absolute truth, the statement they just made must not be true. That's right. Must not be true. So... Um, and so, so I got to thinking today, why would someone deny the existence of absolute truth? Why because would someone of relativity. want to do that? They want it to be freewheeling. They want to be able to have their cake and eat it too. They want to be able to say, oh, to be a virgin when you get married, that's not so important anymore. To, you know, to open up the, the floodgates of, of free sex and you know, I came through the hippie era. <laughs> All kinds of sin in the world. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's not just limited to sex. I mean, because, you know, uh, you go through the bank line and the teller gives you too much money. Do you give her back what doesn't belong to you? Or do you say, hey, I won. <laughs> yeah. And keep on going. I, I actually saw a video clip on YouTube the other day that was uh, uh, at a, a store. I believe it was a drug store where someone was being arrested for shoplifting. And there were people standing around that, that said, that, that is not wrong in all situations. Well, yeah, it is wrong in all situations, <laughs> but, but now this person's going to have a criminal record, and, and why should they be subject to that? Well, it's because we need to take well, personal and, and responsibility back, for what we do. Getting back to applying the Bible to uh, our everyday lives, uh, God makes provision for that. He says that, you know, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor doing honest work with his hands. And in the Old Testament, it talks about when, when somebody steals, that they, you know, and even if they're doing it because they're hungry, they still have to go and, uh, and repay what it was that they stole. And there, there are specifics about how much you pay if you stole a a goat and how much you pay if you stole a cow, mm -hmm. you know, and so uh, uh, so God, you know, he says, okay, well, yeah, you're hungry, I get that, um, but you got to pay it back. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so really, it just opens the floodgate to a lot of sin, yes, and, it and it gives nobody any accountability. There doesn't right. have to be accountability if there's no absolute truth. Um, but then I also got to thinking about how, um, how there are scriptures that uh, pertain specifically to people who say there is, absolute, there is no absolute truth. And that comes from uh, Psalm 14 and verse 1, where it says, The fool says in his heart, God does not exist. They are corrupt, uh, they do vile deeds, and uh, there is no one of them that does good. And so, so I thought, well, uh, that really fits. So... <laughs> Uh, I uh, also had some scriptures. I thought I had one out of Psalms. No, nope, not in this one. Okay. Um, but First John 1, 8, if you claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Mm -hmm. um, so God is clearly saying that if you say that you don't have sin, you're a liar. And if you're a liar, then you're not truthful, and truth prevails. So. Amen. Amen. So, so as I began to study this, I thought, um, you know, where, where are we going to go with this? And, 
And I'd like to bring up, I love the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I think some of the greatest teaching that Jesus ever had. Well, I believe that if you didn't have anything except the Sermon on the Mount, you would have everything you need to know to be a Christian. I believe you're right. Um, but in Matthew 5, 27 through 30, you were talking about sexual sin earlier. Um, this is all about adultery. And so, so I thought I, I'd read this through, and then we could talk about it here for a little bit. It says there, you have heard it said, uh, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away, for it is better to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, uh, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better to lose a part of your body than to lose your whole body to go into hell. And so, so I got to thinking about that and, and uh, laws, the rules, the commandments that God gave us. He didn't give us uh, to kill our joy, but rather to keep us from suffering the consequences of sin. Do you agree with that? It was for our good. God, God so says it over and over in the, uh, in the Decalogue, the first five books of the Bible. Uh, uh, he says that uh, he gave us his rules, his laws, for our good, for our betterment. If we live by those, then we will have long life, length of days, and we will prosper. Uh, that's one of the, the uh, prevailing premises that goes throughout the Pentateuch. I meant Pentateuch. I didn't mean Decalogue. I meant Pentateuch. Decalogue is the Ten Commandments. The Pentateuch is the first five books. So, so, but it's it's replete throughout that whole thing that uh, that I give you these rules, so you'll have a good life, and if you obey these rules, you'll have a good life. But if you dis if you go against these rules, then you're going to have misery, and and we have it rampant right now in our society today. We do. And to get back to our, our question that our, our folks are asking, um, is that those laws are absolute truth. They have not changed Never. since God gave those laws. God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, and, and he you, will remain that way. And in fact, you were uh, in Matthew a moment ago with the uh, Sermon on the Mount, and in Matthew chapter 5 and 17, it says that I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Exactly. And so, and so Jesus is saying that, that the law is still in place. You know, the moral code of the law is still in place. Now, what about somebody who says to you, well, um, it says in the law that you're not supposed to eat shellfish. Then, then uh, you know, if you eat shellfish, you're breaking the law. Well, um, that, that was, let me see. Well, quite frankly, I just tell that person, well, I'm, I'm not Jewish, and those were Jewish <laughs> dietary laws. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, that's so, good. But uh, because the, the, the law was broken up into three sections, there's the moral code, mm -hmm. there's the uh, judicial code, which is just for the territory of Jerusalem, like putting a parapet around your house, uh, you know, the tribes are divided, and that's all part of being a member of that tribe. Uh, and then there's the uh, ceremonial law. And I believe that the uh, dietary laws were all part of the ceremonial law. Right. Where, and the ceremonial law is, is summed up in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We still need blood to be forgiven, you know, Leviticus uh, uh, 1 says that they would put the hand on the goat and then they would kill the goat and the goat represented, you know, their sin transferred to the goat and they killed the goat and the sin was gone. But they had to keep going back to the goat because their sin didn't stay gone forever. But Jesus, his blood shed, cleanses us from all unrighteousness and and. And that's once for all. You, yeah. The priest doesn't have to keep going to the, to the altar. So. Yeah. 
So, so one of the reasons why I brought up this scripture was to demonstrate uh, the absolute truth that exists within that and how we can apply that to our life. Yeah. So um, I believe that not only was Jesus talking about adultery within marriage here, but he was also talking about all sexual sin. Mm -hmm. So chastity before marriage, faithfulness within marriage, uh, the marriage of one man to one woman, uh, the whole, whole thing there. And, and it really was meant to keep us out of trouble. Uh, one of the hotly debated subjects right now is abortion. And we shouldn't even be having that discussion because if we followed God's absolute truth in the laws and people would remain uh, chaste in singleness and faithful in marriage, there would be no reason for abortion anymore. Right. Uh, but, but we have broken those laws. And it's because we've gotten away from absolute truth. Yes. So does it exist? The answer is absolutely. There's not a doubt in my mind that absolute truth does absolutely. exist. Absolutely. <laughs> it does exist. Um, so, uh, so I think we've answered that question pretty well. Uh, hopefully um, you're able to understand and uh, to know that there is absolute truth in this world. And um, if someone is denying absolute truth, it's probably because um, they want to live in sin and don't want to uh, face the consequences that come along with it. And uh, that's what God had in mind for us, was to help us avoid the consequences by sharing the absolute truth with us. right there to guide you unseen